Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, Craig Martin, I'm the deputy head teacher here at Perth Grammar School. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming along tonight. Really appreciate your attendance. Um, we are we're, we're exceptionally privileged tonight. Um, we're joined by colleagues uh, from the Lighthouse, YMCA, Mindspace, and PCAFs, and we're going to hear from them just about what their role is and what they can offer uh, families and uh, pupils in the Perth Grammar School community. Um, so it's really, you know, tonight's purpose is to be informative. Um, it's to let you know what they do. It's to let you know how you can contact them, what your, um, how you can engage with these supports um, for your for your pupils, for your young people, um, and and how we do that as a school as well. Um, tonight's tonight's session is recorded, um, and it will be available for you via the school website. And you can go back and you can have a look at anything. So please don't worry if you've missed anything tonight um, or if you need to ask questions or anything like that, you can indeed contact the school, contact anybody um, via the school website and we can we can provide clarity on anything that's said tonight by any of our, our partners that work with us. Um, so without further ado, I would just like to, um, but just before I hand over to Sharon Thomas from the Lighthouse, I'd just like to thank Alan Klein, who is our community link worker, who has put um, put the effort in tonight to, to arrange in this evening um, and getting everyone around the table so that we can have this tonight. So um, so thank you, Alan, and I'd now like to pass on to Sharon Thomas. From Thank you, Craig. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. OK, Sharon. So my name's Sharon Thomas. I'm the manager here at the Lighthouse for Perth. Um, if you've not heard of us, we work with all schools through Perth and Kinross, and we deal with uh, mental health in young people, particularly the age 12 to 18 group. Now, we are, there has been concern about the rise in mental health, not surprisingly, in our young people over the past two years. What they've been through is unprecedented, really unprecedented times. Um, and one of the main things that we are seeing a major hike in is young people reporting with anxiety. And a few weeks ago, I got together with Alan and Franny and a few of the others, and we were discussing how we can best equip you as parents on how you can tackle this anxiety, how we can help you manage with your young people. So I'm going to do a bit of a session on that this evening. Um, an overview just of the lighthouse first is we take referrals direct from the schools, also direct from young people, and parents can contact us direct also. We deal with high risk mental health, um, very much suicide, self-harm, but also people who have emotional distress, such as anxiety, that's at a level where it's affecting their day-to-day -day life. So it's really debilitating for them, okay? So one in five teenagers will have a diagnosed mental health condition on average, um, but wait between eight to 10 years before asking for help. So that is a lot to do with um, the stigma around mental health that we're still trying to tackle. It's to do with not knowing where to go for help, who to ask, and they're still around about it. They, they don't know what's going to happen once they do get help. So this is where we come in and we try and make that journey much easier for them. And the referrals we get through the school, we found that coming here to our crisis centre, which is a really safe space for them, is getting them through that door. Once they're through there, it's, it's already over a big hurdle when we find that on a regular basis. So it's recognising when your child's mental health is dipping. That's much more easier said than done. Because, well, let's face it, it's teenagers we're dealing with. They've got their own language. Like, the, the, I mean, I've, I've not been able to decipher that grunt yet. Like, you know, what it means, like, and the shoulder shrug and things like that. We had a good day at school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, unfortunately, they, they don't share that language with us. They don't want us to completely understand it. That's for them to keep. So we need to be on the ball to be looking out for, for other signs that their mental health is not really in a good place. I know we've all been through COVID and people will say, well, it's not just the kids, but we need to bear in mind that two years out of our life as adults is a small percentage. You take two, two years out of a 13, 14, 
15 year old life is massive and their whole way of life has been taken away from them. I mean, I know at the end of a working day, I'm happy to go home and just sit in nice and quiet, cup of tea, be isolated in my house. For young people, after the school day, that's when their social life starts and everything was taken away from them. Even their schooling, like their social life after it, all their clubs, all their activities, their very being, because they are social beings and technology was no substitute for it. It did help, but it was no substitute. I don't know if you've noticed recently, but what is causing a lot of anxiety where young people is they've actually lost some of their ability of the unwritten rules of how to communicate. So, as you know, if, if we're sitting in a group and, and we're all talking, nobody says it's your turn to talk or it's your turn to talk. The turn taking is just something that you learn. And it's and it's a, everybody learns it, but it's not a written rule. But they had so little communication with people. And then when they have, they've had masks in front of their faces. So now they take the mask off and it's just a big wobble. And it's just a big noise because they've all forgot how to turn take how to wait to get the cues and the signs that you get in a conversation. And for some kids, th that's really scary. And the noise and the not, not being able to make sense of what's going on. And that's when you start to see the anxieties coming through. So it's really not surprising that we are seeing a big upturn. But it's not all a bleak picture. The resilience our young people have shown has been amazing. And I think we need to every time when they do come to us with these issues with their mental health to remind them just what they've been through and how well they are doing because they are there they are doing amazingly well and, and they need to be reminded of that so what's the signs that you could be watching for as parents that your kids mental health is sleeping it is slipping so sleep the sleep patterns uh, Believe it or not, a teenager still needs between eight to ten hours sleep a night. Now you say that to a lot of teenagers and they'll just laugh because that they just don't get that. But they do because they're still growing and, and they're still for, their brains are still forming. So they need to get into a good sleep pattern. If you see the sleep starting to su suffer and they're struggling to get that sleep and they're waking a lot or they're sleeping at the wrong times, then don't just automatically think it's because they're on their phones all night or they're gaming. Maybe just take a wee, a wee few minutes just to ask them, no, oh, are, are you struggling to get to sleep? Is there an issue? No, oh, because one of the things that's first affected will be their sleep. Appetite is another one. Now, again, if you've got a teenager in the house, you will know that this is really hard to decipher if it's just a normal teenage thing. Is it the hormone? Is if it's if it's boys, like you just cannot feed them enough. Girls, they start to get very conscious and aware of, of how they look and, and that changes their appetite. So again, it's trying to be, decipher what is the mental health that's causing it and what's the normal teenage cycles that they go through. Personal care, we find is quite a big one. Now, you're more likely to pick up on that before your child is they won't notice that they might be a bit smelly, but you will. And they might be somebody who was never like that. So that is a really good sign for you can think, right, there's something something not right here. And again, you've got the teenage thing with the hormones, where they start to grow and they start to sweat. So it's softly, softly when you approach on matters like that, because um, you want them to keep an open communication with you. You might see a drop in functioning. Now, that's very hard for us to see at the moment because their schooling has been so disrupted. But just keep reassuring them that what they're doing is, is their best. But if you see them withdrawn because that function is dropping, then that's that's an issue. Alarm bells should be ringing then. They start to withdraw from sports clubs. They don't want to be with their groups of friends. Um, withdrawn from even from family and friends, spending more time in their room. Uh, that, Ask them, you know, why you know, do you not feel comfortable sitting with us anymore? They'll probably say no because they're teenagers, but at least you've asked. <laughs> and, and it gives them that line of communication if there is another reason. And they might start to have this problem thinking, illogical thinking, thinking that things are going to happen that's not going to happen, which 
it's not surprising that they would think illogically these days. I mean, every time we start to give them a wee bit of their normal life back, along comes another variant and we take it all back again. And so they're now starting to think, am I ever going to get my proper life back? And we're starting to see a lot of adverse behaviours because of it as well. So the lockdown and then another lockdown and another one. So, OK, I know I'm only 14 and I shouldn't really drink, but they've actually let us out of lockdown. So I'm going to do everything because they're going to lock us down again in another couple of months. So it's, it's trying to understand why they're going a bit off the scale at the moment as well. And of course, that has a knock on effect on their mental health. And we're seeing that we're seeing more drug and alcohol use as well in our young people. And again, that's a vicious circle. It affects their mental health and vice versa. So anxiety, I would say, is probably one of the biggest things that we see that they're coming with. And I think we as adults, as parents, as teachers, we can definitely um, help them normalise that more. There's a big difference between being anxious and suffering from anxiety. But kids will automatically come in and go, yeah, I've got anxiety. Right. Well, we'll sp speak to them about it. Try and decipher if you've got full blown anxiety or are you anxious? Being anxious is normal. Actually, recent studies have showed that, uh, that being a bit anxious can actually increase performance because so if, it, if it's accepted. So when you're feeling a bit anxious, don't fight it. And this is what we need to learn our kids. OK, you've got an exam coming up or you've got a big football match coming up or you're going to some big dance competition. That's good that you feel a bit anxious because it's normal. It's adrenaline in your system. So normalise that word anxious with them and stop them from making that word anxious into the word anxiety because there is a big difference in it. And we will find that a lot of the people that are coming with us with anxiety just need to normalise it to that anxious level. And they don't, it, it, in itself, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. They, so they think, oh, so I don't have full-blown anxiety. I'm just a bit anxious. Yeah, and that's normal. And it's a good thing if you accept it when you are anxious and don't fight it. Oh, right, OK. So, and then it's got a, a, a positive effect on them. And so then they start to see being a bit anxious as a positive thing and they look at it completely differently. If they keep looking at it negatively, that, that anxiousness will develop further and they will become into that anxiety category, which is very, very debilitating for them. The worst thing you can do is worry about getting rid of the anxiety when they have got to that level, when they're up, when they have got anxiety, because that just sends their nervous system into overdrive and it makes it worse. So there's a there's a really good resource I'll give you at the end, which is a fantastic book. And it's actually about worrying about worrying. So it's having anxiety about anxiety. And, and it is, it's a vicious circle if you get into it. And kids will get into it because we see it, they come in here and they're up to high dough and they're so anxious and they're but but they're anxious because they're feeling to this and they can't get rid of this feeling, but it's because they're trying to fight it, and that's the worst thing they can do. So the first thing you need to do, if, you're, if your kid is really struggling with anxiety or that anxiousness is just getting a wee bit too out of control, the first thing you need to tell them is to accept it. It's normal. Start to accept that, we, that life has been hard and you will be more anxious now than you used to be because there's more things to be anxious about, but that's still OK. It's OK as long as you accept it and keep it normal. So you just sit, you sit them down and tell them, look, you're in a safe space. If you're sitting talking to them and nothing bad is going to happen. When we get people coming in here with anxiety, to, I'll, I'll give you an example of how severe anxiety can be for a young person. We had a young lad came to us after the first lockdown who hadn't managed to get back to school after the lockdown. Before lockdown, he was he had been an S5, straight A student, school captain, had everything got great social life, bunch of friends, had all his A's bagged for university choices, whatever he wanted, thought I'll have a nice easy sixth year and then COVID hits. 
And when it came to going back to school, he couldn't get out his front door. You know, this is his parents were saying, oh, you're suffering from anxiety. And the anxiety went to full blown panic attacks. And this, the, the, what he suffered through those panic attacks with the, the actual physical symptoms, being sick and actual vomiting, his whole way of life was so, so different to what his old life was. By the time he came to us, he had suicidal thoughts. And the reason that I had went to suicidal thoughts is because he said, I don't want to live like this. I, I, I don't want this life. And the first thing we were able to say to him is, you won't have to have this life. We can help you manage what's happening here and you can go back and have your, your, your life and have it the way you want. You can have control of this. And within that first session we had with him, we had, there was no even any need to do a safety plan. We had dispelled his suicidal um, thoughts. He no longer felt that he was at that level of suicide. We still had a long way to go to get him to a good place. But we did, that lad's at university now, having a great time. His mum contacted us uh, just at Christmas. She said, still not sending Christmas cards. Give me your bank details. She says, I know it's not a lot of money, she says, but how am I ever going to repay you? Because you just gave me back my son. She says he, he was there, he was still there in the house, but he was just a shell. She went, even his cheeky banter and everything. She went, I cannot believe how debilitating anxiety can be. She went, and we just didn't know what to do. She says, and you just gave us him back. And I says, no, he worked hard to get himself back there. It was just realising that he needed the help when he did. So it's so important for us to try and decipher at that level, is this teenage normal hormonal behaviour or are they struggling? And do you know the best way to find out if, if what the difference is? Talk, talk to them. Sit down and talk to them. The physical symptoms that you will start to see if you feel that you need to have these talks with them. They might start complaining about headaches. Um, they're tired all the time dry mouth, sweating. When it gets to that stage where we've seen with this lad, I mean, physically, not just feeling sick, actually being sick. Um, they can have heart palpitations. They, and, and they are, they're real pains. They have real chest pains. They really do think that they're really ill. And again, that leads to further anxiety. And you can see how that can spiral. So we need to sit them down, make sure they know, look, nothing bad's going to happen. Anxiety is nothing more than the adrenaline gland in your body overworking and it's released all this adrenaline and that's why you're feeling that right now. It's putting you into fight or flight mode. So let's sit down and accept that that's what's happening. And once you accept that's what's happening, we can deal with it. As soon as you accept it, then you can start to see, right, how do I reduce this adrenaline? Hey, concentrating my breathing be calmer and straight away you can when we do it with the kids you can see in front of our eyes like you know a good 10 minutes but then they're completely back to calm because the adrenaline gland will eventually stop producing the adrenaline and it is a chemical and it will stop and you will control it and getting them to realize that they can control that it's in their control is very it's massive when they realize they've got that control because they, it's given them something back, which and I've had so little control on their lives recently. And so it's, it works so well to give them the tools. We're not curing them, they're doing it themselves. Like I said to that mum, we didn't do it, he did that himself. We just helped him discover the tools to do it. And he did it himself. So how do you keep their, their, their mental health in a good place to make sure that, that this, is, this is not happening? Work on their self-esteem. Remind them how resilient they have been, how proud we are of them, because, the, because we are. This is a generation who are always going to be known as this COVID generation. They are going to be wrote in history books about these kids. Right? This isn't just something that after two years or three years, hopefully, it's, it's all gone and they talk about something else. This is going to be something that's going to be wrote in history for years and years that they are living part of right now. And we need to build their self-esteem around that and say to them, look what you are doing yeah. and look what you're achieving. Yeah, maybe you're struggling a wee bit, but 
my goodness, you still made it into, that, into school today. You still managed to get up out of your bed. I mean, that's, you, we just don't know when a kid turns up at that school gate, we don't know how much it took them to get there. And, and so when the parents at the weekend, when you're thinking, right, you've been long lie enough, get out of your bed, just a wee extra thought of what they've been through recently. Maybe just cut them that wee bit of slack. Not too much though, because you don't want them going the other way. Okay, because exercise is so, so important to keep them in a good place. And, and that's proven, studies prove physical health leads to good mental health. So, and it doesn't need to be running a marathon or it, it's whatever is good for the individual. Tailor it all to your kid and how you feel that your kid needs, like what, how much exercise they need. Because it could just be a walk, whereas somebody else does need to go out and do a run for an hour because they've got that much to expand. Diet is another big one. Now, my car would, I, I fight with my car going by McDonald's because it wants to go to the drive through but I, I know I can't let it go there every time. But it's okay occasionally, and it is okay occasionally, and let them have their treats, but make sure it's balanced. So, and parents use can easily affect this by having fruit lying about the house, having healthy snacks lying about, because teenagers are impulsive. And they can be a bit lazy, they don't want to go and cook things. So if there's something there, and if it just happens to be healthy, but it saves them cooking, they might just eat it. So, so leave these things just placed about the house for them. Stick a water bottle in their bag every day. Make sure they stay hydrated. Yeah, parents, I know I can hear you saying big enough to get their own water bottles. But come on, just, let, just, just for now, they, they are the COVID kids. Let's cut them a wee bit of slack here. And it takes us two minutes to put a water bottle in the bag. I know, but they will get used to doing it themselves and then they will look for it. But let's just give them that wee bit of extra hand after what they've been through. Make sure any coping mechanisms that you do use with them is not something that you read out a book because one, the, one uh, mechanism does not suit everybody else. And the only, again, you need to talk to them. Quality conversation. If there's anything you take out of tonight's session, please let it be that quality conversation with your kids. What we do is we, this is me taking my work home with me, which I always get around for from our kids, but we know everybody's busy and we've all got busy lives, especially when you try to juggle so much different things now. So it's not easy to sit down together for a meal, but you make a rule in your house that there is that one day, a Friday or a Saturday or whatever, that yes, you do all sit down, no devices whatsoever, no TV on the background, and you talk. Well, see the first couple of times we did that, the silence was eerie. And they're sitting there going, right, you made us do this, you talk then. Like, and I'm saying, no, well, let's talk about the week. How's your week done? And it was awkward for a couple of weeks. But see, after a couple of weeks, they actually look forward to it now. And see now it's almost like right one at a time like not because it's like they, they almost save things up because they know actually we are really listening to them because this is our quality time we're actually going to listen to you when they come in for school you, how many use parents go do you have a good day and they go yeah or to give their wee shrug or whatever and you just leave it at that you need to ask them twice if you ask them and say well, no but so how was your day and they kind of look at you as if to go, oh, it sounds like you're actually really want me to answer that and are you really interested? No, oh, have, you, have you got time to listen? Yeah, because we're going to make that time to listen. This is how we can head off the, all these anxieties at the beginning. And then, but also open those lines of communication so that if they do start to develop mental health issues, they're going to talk to you about it. And you are going to be able to share that journey and help them from the beginning. You've got to talk to them and you've got to prod them to talk and it won't be easy and there will be the awkward silences, but do not give up. Make them talk to you. Thanks for that. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to Franny now. I think I've talked enough. Um, so uh, Franny McGrath from uh, YMCA.
Is that me unmuted now? Thank you. Sharon, I was taking some notes there myself, so thank you very much for that. That was uh, very informative, so thank you. Um, yeah, Franny McGrath from YMCA Tayside, and um, got a couple of minutes just to tell you about some of the opportunities that uh, we have for your uh, young people. Uh, we've been in the area for around 25 years now, 27 years, uh, so we're um, well established and we keep kind of you know, developing more opportunities uh, year on year. So as it stands the now, we actually have worked um, in partnership with uh, the grammar school and indeed all the secondary schools across Perth and Kinross um, for around 20 years. So we're kind of well known in a number of the secondary schools, schools uh, across the uh, local authority. And what we can um, offer your young people is basically a safe place to go. Uh, we've got drop-in facilities in, in the town. We've, we've just moved last week uh, to the old Craig Don Centre. So that's 25 to 29 Canoe Street. And on a Wednesday evening between four and half five, uh, young people from S1 to S6 are welcome to come along there. They can play air hockey, games of pool, and there's all sorts of activities and there's loads of space where they can just sit and chat to their peers. But importantly, there's around 10 youth workers on hand at these drop-ins where young people sometimes, you no, know, great if you can get into that habit of talking, um, obviously, to your young people and they talk to you, but on occasion when they don't, they might feel a wee bit more comfortable talking to some of our youth workers. And um, it doesn't need to be um, an either or in that case. Obviously, it's good if they're doing both, but our guys are on hand, they're experienced, and they're, they're really good at building relationships up with young people. But other drop-ins on a Friday night, and that's a wee bit later, 7 o'clock till 8.30pm. And again, it's at, straight across for the Sandy Man. So in fact, parents, you could maybe go for a quick pint while your uh, young people come in. Am I allowed to say that? Maybe not. Um, while your young people come into the youth club, you could go and get a wee Friday night uh, gin and tonic. So we've got a number of youth clubs and drop-ins that the young people can come to. But we also have some specific employability courses where they can maybe come and start to explore career opportunities. We've got enterprise courses, we've got outdoor bound uh, courses. We do a lot of work with the Duke of Edinburgh as well. And we've also got a Y Girls mentoring programme where we have 25 um, women matched to 25 young girls between the ages of 8 and 14. And that mentor will meet up with that young girl every week again just as a safe person to talk to, think about how their week's been, reflect on maybe some of the decisions and choices they've made and see how they can maybe move that forward to maybe improve those decisions and choices um, into the next week. And they'll stay with that young person for a minimum of a year. So they're a real trusted professional in their life. They're not trying to take the role of um, obviously the parents, um, but they are there as an extra person uh, for the young person to to talk to. Um, we also have media facilities where they can come and learn coding and loads of other things that I don't absolutely have a clue about, um, but we call that project Why Media. And again, there's a lot of our youth workers are quite young as well, so they can you know, get alongside young people and really understand the language uh, that they're speaking. And also it's maybe not been that long since they've experienced uh, similar things themselves. Um, and they usually, once they're engaged in some of our drop-ins and other opportunities, then they continue to do so uh, for a number of years. Uh, more recently, we've partnered with the um, Grammar and Riverside Church, just right beside the school, to provide a place where the young people can maybe just break out of school for an hour or so uh, to have a quiet place with some reflective music where they can come and study without all the kind of hustle and bustle uh, around them of their friends. So that's literally just a new project that we've launched in the last couple of weeks, and that's Gather Momentum uh, week on week. But it's there for any young person, and that's on a Wednesday from half one to half three. And they might only come for half an hour, get their kind of heads, uh, maybe do some breathing exercise, reduce that anxiety as they maybe head back into their exams. And then from there for maybe some young people that decide they're going to leave school and they might not have everything they need to progress into further education or indeed a job, 
we can again offer that continued support to help them. Um, yeah, just in some of the choices that they need to make and access some of the opportunities. And sometimes that involves getting funding as well so that they can take that next step um, and even just think about the career they might want to do. Because often, if you're like me, I was 27 before I stumbled into uh, the type of work I'm in. It was never a career option. And I know you're thinking, wow, he doesn't look 27. But yeah, that was um, that was a number of years ago, I might add. But yeah, you can check our website out at um, www.ymcatayside.com and it'll give you a lot more detail on all those opportunities we have. Or you can speak to any of the guys, uh, Matt the Grammar, who know us quite well as well. I will now hand you over to Sarah um, from PCAVS, who will tell you a wee bit about their services. Thank you, Franny. Hi, everyone. My name's Sarah and I'm here from PCAVS Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub. So we have two service locations. We have the Walled Garden in Perth, so that's based in the grounds of the Murray Royal Hospital. And we have Wisecraft, which is in Blair Gowrie. So we're an activity based service, so we encourage anyone aged 16 and above who is maybe experiencing difficulties with their mental health and well-being to engage in a variety of therapeutic and skill based and meaningful activities. And that's really to help improve resilience and confidence and mood, to reduce stress, reduce anxiety um, and to gain some skills personal skills, social skills, and hopefully move into more kind of positive destinations. So across the two service locations, we've got five activity areas or activity departments. So we have um, a creative wellbeing department. So we run workshops throughout the week on performing arts, arts and crafts, music and creative writing. Uh, we have a fully equipped joinery workshop in Blair Gowrie where clients can work on their woodworking skills and we're open to the public so people can make orders and the clients can see the progression from start to finish of making something and selling something and delivering something which is really empowering. We have a public cafe in Perth so clients can gain work experience in the cafe cooking and catering skills anything from uh, serving the public till work making food baking um, anything really that um, that they're interested in and will help them in future. And we have two gardens, so we have a large garden space in Perth and a smaller garden at Wisecraft for anyone who wishes to engage in some horticultural activity. And we have a healthy lifestyle department as well, so we do weekly walks, like weekly health walks, uh, from both service locations and our healthy lifestyle worker. She does a lot of work around resilience and anxiety, stress. We do like cooking groups um, and she does some movement and relaxation groups as well. So like I say, we are, we're open to anyone aged 16 and above. So you may feel that this is relevant to any young people in your household or for yourself. Um, and we very much take an intergenerational approach. So clients of all ages work together and learn from one another, which is really lovely to see. But we do also have a specific focus on the 16 to 25 year olds. So we developed a project called Lost in Transition a number of years ago, and it's been really successful. Um, over the past few years, we've worked with just over 100 young people, um, and that's funded currently through the National Lottery. So the reason for that is because a lot of our older clients have, you know, maybe experienced symptoms for a long period of time and feel that they're in a place in their lives where they are confident enough to kind of walk through our doors and, and ask for that help. But for a lot of young people, symptoms can be quite new and quite scary and daunting. So we really felt there was importance of having a youth specific worker um, there to help young people engage with us. So the youth officer can you know, meet any young people in school or at home or any kind of external um, place that's, that's comfortable for them and you know, physically help them into the service and engage in the different activities. Okay. We can accept self-referrals 
Um, but we do also require a risk assessment form to be completed and it's a very straightforward form um, and that can be completed by anyone at the school or any other health or social care professional um, that the family is working with. And in terms of linking with the schools, we do work with a number of young people who are at school um, and we just liaise really closely with the schools and help to integrate ourselves into the pupils timetable and it works really well. So that's that's pretty much us in a nutshell. Um, if you're looking for any further information, if you'd like to come over to the wall garden for, for a wee visit to meet with me, that's absolutely fine. Um, I can pop my, my email address into the chat, but if you speak with any of the staff at the school, they'll be able to, to pass on my information. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to Doug and Jan from Mindspace. So uh, am I going first, Doug? <laughs> yeah, you go first. You go first. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see you all. Um, I, my name is Jane Berry and I am the Senior Counselor and Coordinator for uh, Counselling in Schools in Perth and Kinross. Um, our service um, is school based for our young people um, in five of the schools in these areas and we work uh, Monday to Friday. So what is counselling for your child? Well, it's a free service that you can um, receive via referring to the school or come to us at Mindspace in York Place. We would do um, a referral form for them, which you're more than welcome to help them fill out. But generally, this, if, if they're self-referring, the schools will um, pass on these referrals and then we will try to get to see these young people as soon as possible. Um, I think it's really important to say that some young people don't like to go through schools to access counselling. So at Mindspace, we, um, they can self-refer to our office. And I'll give you a bit of details about that a bit later on. The sessions that the, count, the children have are approximately for 12 sessions for up to about 50 minutes. Normally that's enough for them to talk about their issues. And like others have said, there's many, many issues that's going on. And likewise at Mindspace, a lot of it is anxiety. Um, in our counselling field, we really try to abide by confidentiality for the young person, unless they're at risk for themselves or someone else. Um, it, I think it's really important to say that the therapeutic relationship between counsellor and the client, whether it's a child or an adult, is really important. And that the, the space is really safe and um, they can share what they need to share. We do work closely with the schools to make sure that as many of the needs that have been presented to us are met. If they need extra support from other services, then we will engage in that way. I think really it's really important to say that counselling will offer um, a safe space where a young person can talk or do an, active, an art activity, any way to express themselves. But the main reason um, they come is to, to discover themselves, but also to feel more empowered by the time they finished. And I think that's really important for them. Um, they do have a choice as well with counselling. If they're not ready for it, or they're not going to engage for any reason, then they have the right to say no. From a parent's point of view, um, we as that mind space will um, see parents of any, uh, well actually anybody over the age of 10. Um, so we do have an adult service and we also have a YP service. Um, you can refer in a few different ways, which is online using mindspacepk.com where there's um, different parts of the 
organisation which show all the things that we offer. And you can phone in to the office. Your, ch your child can go to guidance if they need to uh, refer that way. Um, and also the school might um, refer on to us if a child is in great need. And then we will see them as soon as as soon as possible. The ch your child will get an uh, initial an appointment where we assess their needs and find out what they want from counselling because it is about the ch the child here having their voice heard. I think that's that's priority. Um, I'm just thinking if there's much else that you might want to know. Um, I think it's time for me to hand over to Doug. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. I'm going to take it for short and sweet and um, the evening's getting on. So, uh, hi, I'm Doug Stewart. I'm one of the adult re uh, recovery facilitators at Mindspace. Um, we're based at York Place, um, just to the opposite the Grampian Hotel, and we deal with people 16 and above. Um, we do various groups and courses to address mental health in various ways. It could be we have just now we're running uh, Tai Chi classes. We also have uh, writing classes who's that's done alongside the uh, Perth CETA, um, which involves a professional writer allowing people to express their emotions and feelings um, through writing. We have uh, mindfulness classes and we have a class called uh, a course called Taking Control, which is. Something we're going to do at the Riverside um, Church. Alongside the grammar school, so this will be specifically for parents in the grammar school, so we're going to provide a, a six week course um, starting sometime in March. I think the details are on the, the school website uh, for all the information and how to access it, which will be through our website. Um, we have a very simple registration form um, that's just filled in through our website that will then be confirmed if you have a place. Um, the course is going to be based around a therapy called uh, acceptance and commitment therapy. So it's not a therapy as such, but what we do is we use the components of that therapy to address uh, anxiety, depression, racing thoughts and low mood. So it's to basically try and help parents have a bit more understanding about their own emotions, which in turn help them to understand their, their kids as well. Um, we all know what uh, anxiety feels like, um, but a lot of people don't have a lot of understanding about what it is, the mechanics of it, how it's produced and all these things anyway. Um, OK, I'm going to I think I think that's really. Covering everything um, and I think a lot of the details of the, the group will be on the, the school website for further details. OK. I think I'm just going to hand back to is it Craig or Fiona? It's me, Doug. Thank you so much. OK, um, before I do like I've been asked this evening just to wrap things up and uh, do a little summary of things. I just wanted to check with um, Alan. Is there anything else you want to come in with in terms of next steps? Uh, not really. I just want to thank everybody for having uh, given us the time and it's really nice to have so many partners that are so positive Absolutely. and supportive of us. So uh, just to say thank you and thanks to families who've joined us tonight as well. Yeah, that's great. Don't steal my thunder, Alan. Thank you. <laughs> um, but um, certainly this evening, uh, it's been an absolute privilege to be able to attend tonight. And I am um, certainly from my perspective as head teacher at Perth Grammar School. I'm particularly proud of the partnership working that we have in place. We're very, you know, always keen to make sure that we encourage agencies to work with us um, and all the work that they do do alongside us to get it right, basically for um, our children and young people. So tonight's offered us an ideal opportunity to raise everyone's profile um, and it's really important. Therefore, I just want to reiterate thanks to Shan from Lighthouse, Brian from YMCA, 
Sarah from PCAVS and Dugan Jan from Mindspace, and also, of course, Alan for coordinating, and um, Craig for also supporting that organisation, and to Scott for doing all the promoting of it as well. But most of all, absolutely to um, our attendees who have joined us tonight. Um, it's hugely appreciated and hopefully you've been able to, to learn something more about different parts of the organisations that work with us um, and to also ultimately obviously support um, your your ch your own child. Um, so it's basically now mid-term, so I think a huge congratulations to those of us who've joined us tonight on that basis. Um, and I think more than ever before, it seems very apt in a support and family session to be saying to us all to let's encourage our young people to make sure that they refresh and energise and we thoroughly look forward forward to welcome them back on Monday. Thank you very much everyone. Good night.